Welcome everyone. Good to see all the faces coming in. And um, we're here for CG seminar number 204. And we have with us Juliette Tarabian, and she's going to talk about the Cinderella syndrome, revisiting access and widening participation in higher education. Now, before I bring in Juliette, let's go through the webinar protocols. Webinar is being recorded. Will be posted online on the CG website in 48 hours or so, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. We're finding more people are picking up our webinars now through YouTube than through the direct medium. A transcript of the chat function will also be posted. So your words in the chat will also be recorded for all time. Now, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or you've got to the point in the Q&A where you're asking your question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but uh, uh, please turn it on when you're asking a question. We recommend using the speaker view setting in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is speaking at any given time. Now, to ask a question, develop your question through the chat function, type it into there. And I'll select the Q&A participants on the basis of what's coming through in the chat. So we select on, on the basis of relevance to the presentation. So respond to the presentation when you frame your question, but also uh, time as well. If you come in early, you'll get into the Q&A, providing your question is focused on the, on the presentation. And if you come in very late, you'll probably miss out. As I say every week, make sure that you come in towards the end of the time the speaker is finishing up, which will be about 30 minutes or just after that. And then you'll be certain to be part of the discussion. When we get to the point of bringing you into the Q&A in the discussion, I'll give you a warning in the chat beforehand. Um, and uh, we're invited in, please unmute yourself, turn on your video and then state your name and, and where you are from, your affiliation, and then give us your question or statement. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce Juliet E. Tarabian. Juliet is a postdoctoral fellow in sociology of education at the University of Luxembourg, a regional editor of Western Europe for the Journal of Comparative and Higher Education, the CIES. Uh, are you going to be particip participating in the CIES conference, Julia? I uh, hope so. <laughs> which is about to come up. Um, uh, and she's also a senior international specialist in international development and education. So Juliet, the, the screen is now yours. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just upload this and... We can see that, that's good. Good, all right, great. Um, thank you, Simon. And um, hello and welcome to everyone um, to this seminar during which I will explain what I mean by Cinderella syndrome. Uh, when it comes to um, access to higher education. Um, to do so, we will first um, take a look at the definition of the Cinderella syndrome and how it relates to the genuine efforts of countries, institutions and individuals, including myself, I think, uh, in widening access um, for all um, in higher education. Then um, we will, as you can see, we will go um, to look at the workings of our Cinderella syndrome, questioning what is it that we are providing access to? What kind of experiences do students from lower um, um, SES uh, backgrounds have inside the higher education? And if the higher education can afford having a life changing impact on their identity and lives once and if they graduate. Then, of course, the syndrome indicates a belief in a fairy tale that needs to be disenchanted. Uh, so we will also go through some of the ways this can be achieved as treatment. Now, Cinderella is a fairy tale. Everyone, I think, is familiar with it. It's a folklore story with many replications in the modern world promoted through mass uh, culture products. Um, there are all their equivalents in different countries. What I can refer to um, from my own knowledge, I can refer to the Hungarian version, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ham Pipopki, um, it is called, the German version, um, Aschenputel, 
the French version Cendrillon, um, which interestingly includes the word cendre, which means ashes. Um, and I will come back to this. And the Persian version, which is moon forehead. Now, interestingly, aside from the eternal fight between the good and evil, what separates these stories is the shoe. Um, well, the Persian and the German versions are rather radical in um, severely punishing the evil sisters, uh, which is in fact um, the same uh, across all the cautionary tales between these two nations, interestingly. But uh, the shoe seems to be different, um, and that is what makes the difference. So the French version uh, shoe is velvet, the Hungarian one is full with diamond. The miracle of a pair of shoe is always there. So these are stories. Um, have the same plot, as you can see. The background is the capitalist society. As you can see, Paris is on the heights and there is a dark and dull uh, city um, down on the hill. Uh, they are generally biased, but even more gender biased. There's a struggle of social classes going on. There are short-lived windows of opportunity for social mobility, and there is always that happily ever after ending. Sounds familiar? I think yes. If you take a look at this uh, document from the World Bank, uh, in which the reasons to invest in higher education are explained, you will see the same trend. But before I go through this, I need to say something else. The idea, of course, of uh, investing in higher education is not something proper um, of an invention to world, um, to world Bank. Higher education has been used for different ends, be it the national prosperity or competition of the global knowledge, knowledge economies. Besides, the World Bank joined the higher education access movement a little bit later, and I can explain that because they woke up to the tragedy of mainly promoting universal primary education in developing countries back in the 1990s, and the fact that the primary education um, graduates could not provide skilled labor for the neoliberal world. And that is when they joined the trend. So back to the table. If you look at the yellow um, uh, figures here, you will see the same Cinderella story being repeated here. From top to bottom, study in higher education, boost your income and your employment opportunities, gain more money, live happily ever after. This is the same thing happening. So the Cinderella syndrome in um, access rhetoric um, is, again, just like the Cinderella story. The background is a neoliberal capitalist, and capitalist world. Uh, there is the, um, and the plot is the same. So, and, and, you know, there's a competition of knowledge economies and their uh, individuals whose uh, objectives are limited to financial gains and nothing more. The magic formula is the same. It says um, increase um, that access to higher education, access to the palace, uh, you will definitely increase your social mobility, break away from the chains of your disadvantaged past, and will live happily ever after. What is being said here is simply look what a pair of shoes, that is your higher education studies, would do for you. Of course, we know now from uh, the background that I gave on the folklore story that there are different uh, forms of shoes. So yes, maybe in the past, this could work. Uh, the late Sir Robinson uh, talked about this in his Changing the Education Paradigm RSA talk. He said, he, this is what he was saying, study hard, get a decent, stable job, retire, die, meanwhile, live a fairy tale and be happy. But under the rules of the neoliberal market and its low wage, low right, short lived contracts, this is no more the case. And the mentalities of the young between 25 to 35 has also differed from the older generation. Uh, well, nonetheless, we all know that the participation in higher education has indeed increased ever since 1960s, 1970s, rise in population, massification of higher education, we all know this story. We have moved away from higher education only for elites to a more recent version of some selected universities for elites, others for the masses, um, which is a good progress. So um, in the Orwellian words, some are equal, but some are more equal than others still exist in our societies. 
Now, as you can see in this OECD table, the participation between the period of 2008 to 2018 has indeed increased from 35% uh, to 44% across um, on average across OECD uh, um, countries. So our efforts for widening access has worked. Good, jolly. Now, let's move on. What is beyond that? Uh, or underneath that bbd bobbidi boo moment. What is it that is students of lower uh, social and economic backgrounds have access to? What are their experiences once inside the palace? Do we break the patterns of disadvantage or do we somehow reproduce them inside the higher education? That is what we are going to do. As you can see in the photo, Cinderella feels rather intimidated when walking through the palace. Well, so do many students from among, from among minorities or lower uh, social economic backgrounds. Bourdieu has explained this through cultural capital, habitus and field. Um, we all know about it. This is not what I'm going to further elaborate here, um, but I think his version of capital, cultural capital um, within the modern society and the prominence of pop culture should be also revisited. But, um, so, okay, good. We are inside the palace, access has been widened, but there are issues of inclusion. What issues? Let's see. Well, parental education background or PEP is known to have an impact on the likelihood of the students participating in the higher education. And knowing this has led to a multitude of national and regional initiatives to widen access, particularly among those from lower economic backgrounds, social and economic backgrounds, or with no, low, uh, no or lower uh, PEP. But the issue is not really only about access, it is about the inclusion. As you can see in this 2019 Euro student report, the students with lower PEP are more likely, these are the red dots, are more likely to feel they do not belong compared to uh, those with higher PEP. Um, as you can see, the average is something like 15% across OECD uh, countries. Well, we can, of course, be happy to know that the support mechanisms that we are providing in our universities is working, and it is only 50% of these group that is not uh, uh, feeling that they are welcomed, but still 20% is um, a number that should be uh, provoke a new uh, sort of effort and change in his strategies to include them. Now, the lack of belonging that we saw was for healthy students. When it comes to disabled students, um, things change a little bit. So do we properly integrate them? Okay, so their access has been a buzzword. We have talked about inclusive education. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is there to protect them. There are national frameworks, regional frameworks, as you can see, a strategy for the rights of persons with disabilities 2030 um, at the European level. I have given the example of the UK. In all these discourses, what happens is that they consider any kind of direct or indirect discrimination against persons with disabilities, um, against the law. Hold it there. In reality, what Foucault said was that, and unfortunately this was uh, the case even more during the pandemic, in our modern societies, we make persons with disabilities invisible by the very fabric of our roads, of our buildings, of our cities, and even with the lighting in our cities. Now, put that aside, access has been provided, let's see how they feel inside the higher education. As you can see again from this table from the Eurostudent Report 2019, the average of the persons with impairments, the yellow dots, are way higher compared to students without impairments. And it stands, okay, the average is 16. Again, we can congratulate ourselves saying, okay, 16% is okay. We can work to reduce it, but it's still 16%. There are stories behind all the experiences, lived experiences of this 16% that we, 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 we need to uh, um, take care of. Now, this is about the sense of belonging. 
there is, in addition to this, when a student's access to higher education, the question or the continuity of a vicious circle of stratification. Before I answer whether we are providing our students with a rupture uh, from the stratified societies, I need to clarify certain things. Students living in the stratified societies internalize this stratification and may engage, and I'm quoting Simon here, uh, in self stratification agency. That was in your article 2016, if I'm not mistaken. We also know that higher education reflects or mirrors the society, which explains why, for example, Nordic universities are more equal and of higher uh, quality compared to the continental European universities. Then we are indeed talking about a vicious circle because as Sen explained in his vicious circle of uh, poverty, poverty is not only economic, it affects the way a person sees the possibilities of being and functioning. Now, following Nietzsche, who said we are continuously in the process of becoming, if students from lower social and economic backgrounds are deprived by the structure from the possibilities of being otherwise, then higher education participation and social mobility as a result of it can be only a fairy tale. Think about it. The structures are stratified. There is an agency in self-stratification. We replicate or mirror the society. Therefore, there is no happy ending. Now, I'm going to answer the question that I, that I um, asked at the beginning. Do we break or reproduce uh, stratifications? Well, you may answer yes. Yes, we do aim to, part, to participative equity, particularly at the European, um, um, within the European higher education area, meaning that we want the student population to resemble the society, that every section of the society would be represented in our university. This is why we have, had, we have created different modes of entry, financial support mechanisms, across our countries, institutions, but also across Europe, for example, through Erasmus and Erasmus Plus programme. I agree with you. Yes, um, we have to some extent tried to undo the, the social stratification, but we are reproducing the same stratifications. You may ask how. I'm going to explain it. Well, the students from lower social and economic uh, backgrounds are time poor. They need to work and uh, study. This is not a choice. It's a must. So. They are poor in time, they are tired, and knowing that this generation is also constantly distracted by their different gadgets adds negatively to this mix. This means, yes, students have access, thank you very much, but do not spend as much as their peers who do not work to be able to study. As you can see in these two um, charts that I've included, again, from Eurostudent uh, um, 2019, and the other one, I think, yes, from 2019, you can see that. Um, and um, the lower one is, I think, from OECD, if I'm not mistaken. 25% uh, of the student population are affected by time poverty, poverty, which reduces their learning opportunities inside um, higher education. The next thing, okay, so how about gender and age equalities? Do we undo them? Do we disrupt the inequalities associated with these two? Here, I can tell you no. Gender inequalities are among the most pervasive forms of inequalities that is still exist. It is a shame that despite, despite all the progress we have made, we are still trapped in these forms of inequalities. I'll give you the uh, global gender gap. Uh, of World Economic Forum that says globally, uh, closing the economic uh, participation and gender parity will take another 257 years. Now I can go back to that version of the French version of Cinderella, which turns into ashes, Centrion. So in our ashes, maybe we, we can dream of having economic participation and equality uh, between different uh, parts of the society. Now, progress has been made mostly in Western Europe. So we have closed the gap by 72.2% according to World Economic Forum. The issue is 
according to European Commission, 14.1% uh, gender gap pay still persists across European countries. This is our Cinderella syndrome. Take a limit who gain 14.1% lower than their male peers. That's about gender equality. Age, yes, mature students have access. They have been welcomed to higher education um, through different modes of entry, short uh, courses and, and lifelong learning uh, um, objectives of, across the globe, but also in Europe. But many faculty members are not trained on adult learning, which could mean shock, reduced self-confidence, and even dropouts. Another thing that has been persisting, and I have been following that since 2010, when I first concentrated on this, uh, on adult learners, pastoral and academic needs in distance learning, is the lack of mentoring and uh, um, uh, accompanying adult learners while they are learning, which they need more than ever as adult learners. So these are some of the pitfalls of giving access, but not being able to integrate. Okay, so not very successful in breaking those inequalities. How are we doing with migrants and refugees? Again, integration of refugees is supported, guaranteed by international conventions that I've listed here. Um, there are um, the, the UNESCO 2019 Convention on Recognition of Qualifications has actually helped a lot in recognizing the qualifications of third country nationals. Um, there existed system, systems of national recognition, NORICs that we have. We have UK NORIC, we have uh, French NORIC equivalents across Europe to recognize qualifications. Some universities have also been rather successful in providing access, but also integrating refugees and migrants. Particularly what comes to my mind is from a conference on quality assurance here in Geneva two years ago, when um, several Austrian universities um, um, showcase their success stories and uh, it was very fascinating to see how they are integrating refugees and migrants. However, handling the high number of migrants that have arrived uh, in Europe and integrating them in higher education, noting that 52% of them are at the age of university education. This has proved challenging for us. Now, barriers exist both in access to higher education, but also integration, which is even more uh, complicated when it comes down to it. Now, I have included a uh, chart here for you. If you look at this Tandem Report 2019, Tandem stands for Towards Empowered Migrant Youth in Southern Europe. This was a mixed research um, conducted in Italy, Malta, Spain, and Greece. And as you can see, uh, at national institutional and individual levels, there are access barriers, but also challenges of integration. As you can see, we it, it ranges from legal to policy, to cultural, to internal policy, to services, to students and the staffs, and to needs and ex expectations. So uh, um, there is a, a willingness to integrate, but the capacities are not always there to do so, particularly when it comes to integrating. Based on my own experience, there is a still this mentality that they should adapt, that they should integrate, which is limiting, limiting when it comes to reaching out and helping refugees and migrants. Now, the result, unfortunately, is a high dropout rate, not only, and this, is, uh, this was interesting when I was doing this research, uh, to see that the dropout rates are, yes, higher among the uh, social and economically uh, lower um, background students, migrants, mature and minority students compared to their peers, but they are not the only ones dropping out. Now, in the UK, a total of 13.3% students from affluent backgrounds dropped out. That's interesting. Uh, in France, which is not included here, but I can tell you because I know it, the first year dropout rate goes as high as 50%. Well, uh, access to higher education is free. Everyone has the right to access, but well, because there is no selection and because there is no a good service inside the universities, students have a tendency to drop out after the first year. In 2018 and 19, the French government started 
giving universities some kind of freedom to have selective criteria, that helped a little, but, for, but we arrived at 47.5% of admitted undergraduates going on to pass their first year. And this is in Times Higher Education, where I also contributed to. In the US, where the racial discrimination persists, higher level of Hispanic and American Indian students drop out. Across OECD, 31% of the students fail to complete. So yes, total of 69% complete. OECD says it has nothing to do with tuition fees. We know that they have an impact, but they refer to problems inside higher education, integration, inclusion, um, um, shift from academic to vocational uh, fields and the students not thinking that the, uh, the, the field is right for them. Right, so that was about access to what? Now, beyond the miracle of access, let's talk about access for what? Because if we are all for uh, widening access, we're thinking that if students, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, enter higher education, then their lives would be changed. Then they will have better uh, lives. Then they will um, climb up the ladder. Okay, so uh, let's see if, if that is possible. Higher education is not somewhere on Mars. It is on planet Earth in the world where 1% of the population controls 99% of the global wealth. Extreme poverty was on the rise before the pandemic. We have 150 million being added in 2020. Uh, a quarter of the, uh, of the global population lives below 3.20 US dollars and more than 40%, that is 3.3 billion, live below 5.50 uh, um, US dollars. So access to uh, higher education and it's happily ever after the story does indeed carry a Cinderella syndrome. Why? There are a staggering inequalities in uh, the society. There is a reproduction and continued discrimination against billions of Cinderella's that we, are keep, that we keep reproducing. This cannot be addressed by access alone and participation in higher education, particularly if the HE itself is reproducing the same patterns of inequalities and stratification that we just reviewed. So the background, should be changed from what we all have been living in a new liberal, new liberal and utilitarian higher education. This has to be undone. If we want to change students' relation um, after graduation with the society. Now, can we at least say during these uh, there are studies, these students would be educated to actively contribute to breaking the cycle of stratification. Well, the role of, uh, of university has been brought down in the neoliberal world to filling the students with some facts and figures, prepare them to be flexible swans, and I'm quoting Ron Bennett if he's here, hello. Um, accepting any job, being available to accept any contract without the capacity, willingness, and time to question, criticize, unite, or even civically revolt. Participation in higher education, according to Professor Lindsay Patterson, whom I had the pleasure of listening to during BERA conference 2018, does not necessarily rise the level of civic and political engagement among the students. First, he conducted this study in Britain, 2013. Then he did it, uh, he, he conducted a comparative analysis, Germany, France, and, and Italy, I suppose, if I remember correctly, and England. The result was the same. Now, that is one thing. During the pandemic and under the hegemony of recorded classes, many faculty members censored themselves because they didn't want their, uh, their talks to be taken out of context. Many have been victims of hate speech or cyber attacks. This is why in the US uh, we had, uh, in the, I mean, it, 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 that lack of academic freedom has been going on across different countries. We have had it in um, Europe, in Belarus, in Hong Kong, in um, Sri Lanka and in Zambia. Um, repressions have been there in Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, China and Thailand. In the US and UK, we have seen the trends. In the UK, there was a report 
on uh, the Chinese alarming meddling in um, the academic freedom of universities. And in the US, it has created Academic Freedom Alliance to protect uh, um, academic freedom in universities. So, the question is very simple. If you do not have the academic freedom to discuss certain ideas, no matter how provocative they could be, then what kind of education are you allowed to give to these students who, which would make them think, make them question critically, and perhaps try to uh, uh, undo the uh, stratifications that exist in uh, the society? A neoliberal higher education institution creates, should, create docile individuals for work, not for contemplating or disturbing the capitalist social contract. The fight is not placed with the structure, but with others with different identities, including faculty members. The palace, the higher education knows that itself is, it is itself living in a fragile state and can at any moment be replaced by online short courses. So it needs to be in a constant existentialist fight to survive, prove that it is different, needs to invite more fee paying students to continue existing. And so it does try here and there to do what it can to tackle the established rules, but needs to, uh, needs to stay within the norms of a neoliberal system. Now, after having ruined the fairy tale for all of you, <laughs> you may ask, so what now? What are those shifts that we need so much? Haven't we had enough reforms? We have already. Well, there is an urgent need to shift the structures beyond uh, higher education to make access to higher education meaningful and disenchanted. A structural shifts beyond higher education could include fiscal policies and public, public responsibility of those who are holding 99% of the wealth of, uh, the, uh, of the global wealth. Social mobility funding. We have been, been going through performance funding all across the world under the neoliberal rules of the market. Why not changing it for social mobility funding and awarding all those who create these opportunities of social mobility across different levels of um, education and not only higher education. Revisiting ranking systems in line with social mobility. Now, there has been two very interesting initiatives, one, academic, one on social mobility in the UK in 2021, another one for on academic freedom by the Global Centre of uh, Scholars at Risks, uh, who, which has created an academic freedom index in 2020. There is a need for the elaboration of gender equality and inclusion index as well. Uh, these could replace the rankings that do not make any relevance to what the role of the university should be and how access can actually provide uh, a, uh, an opportunity to undo the stratifications that exist um, at, um, within our societies. Another thing is to regulate how private funding um, is attracted for research. We know that private funding in the past have had their say in the way that research has been done. That needs to be regulated so that we would know that there is a, yes, there is a funding, but there are limits of how research and its results could be manipulated. Another thing is shifting our perceptions of inequalities and forms of capital. Now, um, there is something that I was actually wondering when I was thinking about this, and that is about uh, Prince Charming. He's young, but he's disadvantaged. Otherwise, his education and his wealth would have helped him at least in finding a proper partner for himself. It wouldn't have taken his father and the whole kingdom to go and search for his partner. He is disadvantaged. He is also, despite the fact that he is wealthy and educated, his cultural capital does not help his cultural capital and his social capital is not actually helping him to find a very basic partnership with a proper partner. So why not also including that part of the society inside our considerations of forms of inequality and capital? Uh, there is also another thing on doing neoliberalism in higher education. Um, Depatterning and repatterning the pedagogy, not for uh, politically right, but for resistance. Moving away from neoliberal 
maximum profit on the employee side, maximum flexibility on the side of the employed to a new social contract with mutual respect and dignity. I have some concluding remarks and I'm going to uh, reiterate my questions about Cinderella syndrome. Uh, access to what? If higher education reproduces the same social stratifications and inequality, why are we insisting that going to university would help you go up the ladder and you will live happily ever after? It doesn't make sense. Access for what? If higher education does or cannot cultivate our gardens, and I'm using Walter's words, that is freedom of speech, civic and political engagement for social justice and critical thinking, then all those graduated do not have the capacities to question and to change their stratified um, 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 societies that we are living in. So uh, these are some of the questions that we need to ask about ourselves and um, ask ourselves when we are talking about access. Uh, we know that differences in human capital starts beyond the reach of higher education. And this is where the structured shifts and a shift in mental mentalities and perceptions should start so that we can then celebrate the widened participation of students. Now, meanwhile, whether you are like me up there, um, angrily uh, working on widening access and inequalities uh, in education, trying to find a thread to do it, um, or, or not, it is time that we shift. Why? Student population is projected to be on the rise by 2040, we are going to have something uh, close to 600 million students in the world. There are shifts in skills, whether we in higher education like it or not, the World Economic Forum has adopted the Education 4.0. And this is going to have an impact on the way higher education is going to provide um, and educate students. Education 4.0, in January 2020, um, was launched in, in January 2020, is in line with the fourth industrial revolution. And it is trying to reskill teachers and students for the new jobs on the market. There is a shift in economy. We are adapting circular economy action plans all around the world in line with sustainable development goals. And there is a shift towards that kind of economy. So higher education, if we actually want to, we, we need to have a share of uh, socially and economically um, uh, uh, disadvantaged students in this circular economy. We need to, we need to integrate them. So we have, we have a lot um, to do. Um, that is, that is short. Um, I am finished. This paper will be published 2021. I still have a question. I'm still wondering how Cinderella could dance all night and run with high heels with glass shoes. Question that remains. Um, it has been a great pleasure and thank you very much for this time. Thanks, Juliet. I'm sure the shoes were some kind of high tech um, fiberglass, uh, unbreakable uh, <laughs> format. Uh, and you know, your question no doubt could have been answered. Um, Cinderella uh, as a as a myth, as a as a, an image, it's um very powerful, isn't it? It's the uh, it it's the idea we have about upward uh, mobility in in popular culture. It's the strong one. There's no other story like that, quite like that, and it's been very um, I suppose heavily reproduced in the contemporary period which says something about the role of education in itself but there are some differences aren't there as a metaphor I mean it's um I mean the difference seems to me is about agency like uh, I mean all Cinderella really had to do was once the wand was waved she had to look beautiful and then hold exactly. herself together when it all fell apart at 12 o'clock um but um students can work on themselves you know whoever they are they agency you know you can form yourself and you can develop in yourself some of the attribution skills necessary of course agency is conditioned by the resources available to it and there's a limit to which you can do everything on your own but there is that that scope to make yourself freer through your own effort and i think that's that's a difference and education probably fosters that capacity it should foster that capacity um but you know what this shows i think is the power of this, these narratives, these in popular culture. And if someone had designed a story about, you know, college or university, 
you know, in that sort of simple, clear way, on the level of finding Nemo, you know, just the narrative of someone's life or someone's progression, but but using education as the medium, that could have really lodged itself in popular culture. Uh, I think that, you know, Monsters University, the Pixar follow-up to, to Monsters, Inc., which was such a good film, Monsters University was a big missed opportunity because they had was vacuous and said nothing. You know, there was no exactly. useful myths made there, but they could have done that uh, with yes. Monsters University. Anyway, someone out there, think about it. Develop a myth around education and um, let's hope you yes. come up with a good, a good ending rather than uh, an ending which says there was no point to this, there was no opportunity no, no, no. after no, all. And Exactly, so yes, Simon. The hope is for all of us working, and I, and I said <clears> it at the beginning, for all of us working in um, widening access to higher education, the hope is that that happy ending would arrive. But we need to face the realities of the systems in which we are, we are living. We are living against the background of a capitalist society. We are living in higher education systems that are replicating what the society, how the society is stratifying its populations. So we need to be very realistic. Yes, we need to continue, but I think there needs to be a shift in the way that we understand inequalities, as I said, for example, in the case of the Prince Charming, or even the poor minister who runs around uh, the town trying to find, I mean, what is their conditions? What is the happy ending for those? Is it really a happy ending or not? So including a, a bigger population of the students in the way that we understand inequalities and forms of capital um, within the modern ways that our, our, our societies are um, constructed and to the aim of educating students who can actually change those established stratifications um, in the way that they think, in the way that they act, and in the way that they express themselves against such established um, stratified systems. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I'm going to bring in Peter Scott at this point as the first of our Q&A participants. Peter. Uh, thank you, Juliet. It's uh, nice to see you again. Um, <laughs> nice to see you again. The question I want to ask was, um, you have placed a lot of emphasis on capitalism and neoliberalism and so on. And I'm as critical as you are about many of these movements. Um, but I sometimes feel a bit uneasy when higher education always finds someone to blame outside itself. It's sort of- I agree a hundred percent. It used to be, it used to be, you know, access. Well, when the schools produce better qualified people, everything would be sorted. Uh, now it's, you know, there's this awful kind of human capital neoliberal view of, uh, what's happening in higher education, and that's the problem. Um, I think it's a bit more complicated than that, and I think we are actually quite deeply implicated in it. Um, I mean, just to take the example, if you're a higher education institution and you become much more open and inclusive and welcoming to what I just say in shorthand terms, non-standard students, um, you inevitably tend, or you nearly always tend to lose status as a result of, of that. And of course, the lead tables uh, in, re entrench that even more. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strong kind of anti-access bias built into our own views of academic quality and how we exactly. define excellence. So it's not just a structural problem, it's a kind of normative problem mm -hmm. here. Um, so I do think we have to take some responsibility. Um, I mean, your checklist to what should be done, I agree with all of it, but it's all gonna be pretty difficult to achieve. There are certain things that we can actually think about in terms of interrogating our own views and our own values. Exactly. Thank you very much, Peter, for that for that input. Um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I am actually um, in, in something that I'm writing on higher education. Um, I have included this idea that we cannot always claim in higher education saying that we are the victim of what is outside we are participating and as i try to 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 show we are actively participating in reproducing those those patterns so it is not and it is somehow imposed but we are also uh, aligning ourselves as i said because in a, in 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 the context where we are working we need to also show that we are within the lines or the framework of a neoliberal understanding of um, um, qualities, access, um, and all and all that. Um, the, the the thing that I was, um, I mean, I, I also had um, another uh, thought uh, that I expressed in another paper, uh, and that was about the impact of ranking 
if they shifted from what they are now to um, social mobility, sustainability, gender equality, and academic freedom, then will we see all the top universities still on, um, uh, you know, lined up um, in the rankings, or will they suddenly drop off and go to the bottom of the list? Uh, that is a fear that higher education systems, particularly higher education institutions, particularly the elite ones have. And there is not only a resistance from the ranking um, institutions, but also from universities. I'm, I'm absolutely um, uh, agreeing with you on that. And thank you very much, Peter. And thank you both. Um, so Yong, so Yong Lee. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, Juliet, for your really engaging presentation. Um, my name is So Young Lee from Korea. Uh, my question is about a shift in our perspective about the students' expectation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So your research has shown how higher education cannot provide what students are falsely expecting um, that they can get from higher education. So I'd like to ask if you are assuming that students' expectation about higher education is mainly um, about this false um, outcomes, good outcomes after graduation, and also if you are ass assuming that students are not perfectly aware about this situation, that they cannot get everything after graduation. And how, I was wondering how your research address students' expectations about happily ever within higher education, not happily ever after higher education? So that's my question, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for your question. Um, well, I, I, I did try to refer to cultural capital um, that explains how expectations of, of or experiences of uh, students with what is happening um, at universities could differ. Um, those who lack um, the cultural capital may not be um, in fact, um, feeling welcomed, uh, or um, may find it difficult to follow all the instructions or all the lessons because they lack that cultural capital from the beginning. That is one of the explanations that is usually provided. Uh, but the, the thing that um, I am trying to say is that, um, well, um, you see, uh, it is not only, okay, today it is also about a change of mentalities of the students and how they see uh, their uh, presence um, in higher education, the end result that they want. So we, we, are, we are witnessing more and more of the students opting for shorter forms of um, a higher education um, certificates because that would help them get integrated into the market sooner. Right. So it is it, um, there is also there is a book um, that talks about 25 to 35 years old uh, students having a changed mentality, not thinking like their grand like their grandparents or the parents, um, you know, with a house with a big TV screen in it, but um, preferring to be often off uh, often on uh, different jobs, experiencing different jobs and also, uh, um, you know, enjoying life in between. So, you know, mentalities of the students have changed. Uh, sometimes they do not have the um, cultural capital necessary to help them. Sometimes services are not enough or lack quality. I can talk about France. We do integrate many students, but there is a, 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 a problem with the notion of, of service um, in, in French public higher education. Um, so it's a mix of all these factors. Um, I cannot point at one thing and say this is the problem. Um, unfortunately, it is more complicated than it is, but there are ways out of it. I hope I have answered your question. Thanks, Julia. Yes, thank um, and, and thank you, Sayong. So uh, Kamel is next. Kamel Luxaj. Okay. Thank you, Juliet, for this talk. Uh, so I'm interested mainly in academic career perspective. So my question is, do you know any statistics on first generation academics or lecturers in Europe? Because I think that there are some parallels between those exclusion mechanisms discussed by you and the situation of like lecturers. <laughs> I'm not pretty sure if we have any, any empirical data on, on those 
individuals? Uh, about the, uh, the the early career academics you're you're talking. Yeah. Oh yes. And early career, but working class, like with low mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. capital. So. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can only refer to one uh, um, small scale study that I did, um, a comparative analysis between uh, these young academics um, in uh, the UK and uh, France. Uh, that is all I can I can um, talk about. Um, it has not been the focus of my studies, um, to tell you the truth. Um, but what I saw was that many of them were coming from um, families uh, whose, I mean, whose parents, both or one, were teachers themselves. So that was something that they were, that, that notion of educating the youngsters was so vivid and so live in, in, alive in the way that they were uh, doing their jobs. So they were all very enthusiastic. But obviously, um, on short term contracts. Um, and um, when it came to accepting norms of the higher education institutions, including, for example, quality assurance, they were compared to their older peers, more flexible because they have learned to adapt more compared to the older ones who would say, well, I'm an authority myself and I know these things better. Why is a manager who doesn't know anything is, is telling me to do this or to do that? Um, in the UK, what I found was that these uh, teachers were better uh, protected. That is, they were better trained. They had access to training. So they didn't feel lost when they stood in front of students. In France, that was not the case. Uh, they did not receive any training. They were included in the higher education system through uh, shortcut um, uh, methods where, you know, the higher education system, and this happens across the world, that I know. Um, the higher education system says, okay, um, this year I have this population of students. I don't have enough uh, uh, teachers here. How many do we need? 3,000. Okay, these are MA holders of, for example, physics or chemistry. Let's put them to teach um, students without any uh, training on pedagogy or assessment or teaching. That's all I know um, about their feelings. That's all I know. I'm, I'm sorry I cannot be of any more help. Thank you so much. Anyway. You're welcome. Thanks, Camilla, and thanks, Juliet. Um, Hongwei, Hongwei Gu. Hello, Hongwei. Um, thank you, Juliet, for this um, informative talk. Um, I am Hongwei from Oxford. Um, I would like to ask um, how to increase public support for institutions so that universities can be adequately founded to address the needs of the most economically challenged students. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, um, there are mechanisms there already. Um, well, the, um, the governments are, are somehow, I mean, not generally, um, um, Simon, Peter, do correct me, please. In the UK, as far as I studied, um, the case is, well, you are, um, you receive some sort of funding based on your performance, right? Uh, the councils would, uh, would provide, I think. Um, it's, it's based on your REF and TEF, I think. Um, so there is some kind of support. Um, public um, higher education exists in many countries across Europe. And, um, you know, they are providing the service to include um, students from social and economic disadvantaged backgrounds. And I know that in some, um, I'll, I'll go to the case of France and it's uh, Grand Ecole, um, where students have to pay a fee and they have to pass through a very a highly selective uh, admission process. Um, there has been a program that we call uh, integrating students from uh, zones of, with uh, special needs. Uh, zones, educational needs, um, zones with education needs. Um, and uh, there has been an increase of integrating those students from these particular um, cities into these grand ecoles. Um, so um, yes, there are 
some activities, but the thing is, uh, they're not enough. Uh, and the student population is rising, as I said, and the poverty is also rising. So uh, how governments can provide access for everyone, and again, provide access, but how you can integrate and for what result, uh, that's, that's a still um, a big question. Thanks, Juliet, and, and, and thank you very much, Hongwei, for your question. Um, Yuso, Yuso Neminen. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, it left me feeling very pessimistic, and my <laughs> question or reflection really that was not my <laughs> really that. Was that. Not my <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, um, you really uh, encouraged us to shift our gaze elsewhere and look for alternative options um, or alternative solutions for for this question. So I started to think about the opportunities beyond higher education. And I wanted to ask, how do you see the opportunities that other uh, external institutions or agencies could uh, offer for people from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds? Uh, perhaps similar cultural capital could be provided by other other sources as well. You very briefly mentioned, uh, I think, online courses, if I'm not, not wrong. And I don't know if those like massive online courses have have been a key for this, at least at the moment, but, but perhaps an external agency could start providing uh, education of structure to knowledge similar to higher education. And uh, this makes me think whether uh, some organizations, uh, uh, such as disabled organizations themselves, could provide these uh, opportunities. Um, and this is a reflection from someone uh, studying uh, students with disabilities in the context of Finland, where it is the disabled organizations who have been taking care of themselves rather than mm -hmm. the state of Finland who has been mm -hmm. absolutely unable to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, a very interesting question. Well, there are a range of uh, different providers. We have public providers, uh, um, we have uh, private providers, um, we have online providers. So um, with that, we are not having, I mean, the coverage is, is somehow okay, let's say. Right, mm -hmm. but um, the thing is, uh, when it comes down to quality of the question of quality of provision, that is something that needs to be regulated. Yes, we have a quality assurance agencies across Europe, for example, um, in different countries, um, also at outside Europe. Uh, but um, well, first of all, um, for example, private uh, institutions um, are not. Uh, particularly regulated by these national frameworks, although to some extent they are not always. So what happens inside is not really a quality uh, assurance system that is worthy of delivering, right? But at the end, the students do get their uh, graduate degrees, they do celebrate and they do go and uh, get employed. Now, um, is, it, is it the same kind of quality that would in fact uh, help you uh, intellectually uh, to, um, think about um, how a certification is formed in your society and how you can tackle that? Or is it only, again, you know, like a very short process of going to the palace, getting to know the prince, and getting the good job and living happily ever after? So which one are we siding for? Uh, that is the question. Yes, of course, there are some very uh, good establishments that are doing that, but if it comes down to providing what a university works for, a curriculum that is created by specialists for about four years and you go through that and you have time to reflect and, and uh, ponder and, and question and come, you know, go back and forth between your literature and, and uh, your classes, that is um, I think something that would be missing in, um, you know, like uh, short, uh, intensive uh, courses. Um, I can refer to some of these uh, Moodle, uh, I mean, um, the, the MOOC forms, uh, where I have participated for the sake of research, in fact, and I have seen that um, you do your exercises, and then you need to beg other students to do a peer review for what you have done, once they do, I mean, you actually bargain, if you do mine, uh, if you do correct mine, I will correct yours. And that's the end of it, you will get a certificate saying that you have attended in this in this um, course, is it really worth? Is it does it really mean anything? 
does it change your mentality? Does it does it help uh, society walk away from its stratified uh, situation? That's another question. Thanks, Juliet. Um, thank and you. and uh, and thank you, sir. The um, I'm going to take the last three questions together, Juliet, and ask you to respond to them together, uh, and then we'll that'll complete our webinar. Uh, yes. that, so the first one is from Zach Spire. Zach, can you ask your question, please? Hi, Juliet. Thank you so much. This was brilliant. Um, I think my question mainly focuses um, just to ask, uh, how would you exit this? So Cinderella comes to the end of the night. Cinderella's at the end of the ball, um, dashing in her fabulous glass heels. Um, what do you see as a possibility or an, an alternative to such a critique of um, higher education institutions in the pre-fourth wave? Okay, so keep the question in mind. Terry Kim has our second question. Terry. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, Hi, thank Terry, you so much. <laughs> thank you, Zul um, Zulia, for a very interesting uh, presentation. My question is, um, how do we understand the increasing number of dropouts which seem to have become a new fad? is in Korea, which has realized universal access to higher education earlier than um, other OECD countries. Mm -hmm. And when I was a student uh, 30 years ago, it was more or less unthinkable not to graduate. Mm -hmm. But I've heard from parents and also noticed from the statistics that many students after tasting higher education voluntarily have interruptions or just drop out nowadays. And they are not necessarily from the law low SES. No. Mm -hmm. And in the age of industry 4.0, the value of higher education, I think, seems to have become uh, less significant than before. Exactly. And in the contemporary celebrity culture, um, I think young people also look up to the celebrity billionaire college dropouts, such as Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, or, or mm -hmm. Steve Jobs. So I, I'd like to know um, your opinion and research-based um, analysis of this uh, increasing number of college dropouts um, in the contemporary period. Thanks, Terry. And the last question is from Jane Caribo. Jane. Okay. Thank you, uh, Juliet, for the good presentation. Uh, Jane from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, you have uh, made uh, related to what uh, Terry Kim has asked. Uh, in Kenya today, we woke up to the news that the government has suspended uh, funding to 12,000 university students who have taken long to complete their courses. And I'm wondering, uh, could it be that they are getting frustrated? Did you encounter anything like that? Students taking long to complete their degrees and what could the problem be? Thank you. Okay, Julia, it's over to you now. Yes, uh, thank you very much to all of you. Um, very interesting questions, uh, thought provoking. Um, so um, the first question, uh, what do I see as a change? Whereas a change, I would, I would say to do away from how we are thinking about uh, inequalities and um, forms of cap uh, capital. And I'm going to wrap this up with the answer to Terry as well. Um, I am uh, in the process of writing a book exactly on this topic um, and how uh, the um, pop or mass culture, as we call it, um, has affected the mentalities of many youngsters and therefore their cultural capital, whether they are wealthy or uh, from um, disadvantaged social um, and economic backgrounds, has been affected by this mass culture, Hollywood uh, celebrity uh, culture, and how um, gaining money is something that is an end result in it without too much of an effort. Oh, of course, I mean, sit down in a, in a classroom for about four years, a study like us for about, uh, I don't know, 40 years and how much will you gain compared to a footballer who's, who's just um, um, doing some, some um, exercises in the field for 90 minutes. Yes, of, of course, that's understandable. And the role of family, 
that is another thing. Uh, we say that the parental education background has a very um, high impact on the way students access or choose their fields of study inside higher education. To some extent, yes. To some extent, uh, families are no longer role models, models for, their, uh, for, for their children. It is someone outside on Instagram who is their role model that we do not know of. Uh, and these people are making a lot of money without too much effort. Uh, reality shows, uh, you know, that, that kind of style. There is a, a, a change in that, um, from that direction. I have seen it. I have, I have been very, uh, um, in fact, um, uh, positively surprised that during the pandemic, although, for example, books were announced as non-essential in many countries, including in France, um, many started reading books. Now, what kind of books did they read? That's another question. Did they read the uh, stories of uh, Miss Kardashian or did they read Orwell? That's, uh, I don't have any, any, any answer to that. Uh, no statistics. I've been, I've been looking. If you have any, do send it to me because I'm writing on that. But uh, I understand it is, as I said, and this is why I included, it is not, the dropout is not only among um, um, SES students, but also affluent stu uh, students. It's, it's a global phenomenon. Um, and if you can get a degree online, short course, uh, from, for example, Google, and that is something that we need to be uh, aware of. Um, why would you bother um, staying uh, at university for about four years? Particularly at the age of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves and shifting the way that we are uh, delivering and, and uh, providing a different kind of education that would be um, uh, marked by resistance pedagogy and critical thinking. In Kenya, uh, I read a recent report, I was working with some of my colleagues uh, on a project in um, um, Africa, uh, Kenya was not included, uh, but uh, I read a recent report saying that uh, the issue of quality assurance across universities um, in Africa still uh, persists. That's what I read. Particularly this report was talking about engineering courses and how the graduates are sometimes even unable to construct anything or to change anything, you know, or, or to create a company. And, and uh, there was a question about that. Where, um, that, that was part of the, uh, so, okay. Again, the question is in Kenya or elsewhere. Access, okay, good, access, but access to what? And for what end? Um, there is a feminization of higher education in many West um, uh, Asian countries, as we have seen the trend. Um, there is also a higher population of students attending uh, higher education in uh, MENA, in MENA region, um, for example, or also in Central Asia or elsewhere. But, uh, and there is a lot of expenditure public expenditure going there to protect these students or to um, provide access. The issue is many of these students once graduated would go out of the country. So that public investment is lost. And uh, many of the girls, because many applaud themselves of having more girls in higher education systems, particularly in West and in West Asia and Middle East. Yes, that's a very good thing. But many of them do graduate and end up Again, searching that Cinderella story, getting a good husband, uh, getting married, and living at home doing nothing. Again, a lost investment of public expenditure or even private expenditure. Uh, that's the, an the these are the answers that I can give. I have. I hope I have answered your questions. Um, thank you uh, very much, Julia. Lots of compliments in the chat. Uh, you very successful presentation and discussion. So we're very grateful for you to, for coming onto the show and we hope you'll come back again. My pleasure. Um, uh, Johnny Rich has pointed out that there is a ranking on the basis of social mobility. So it's yes. worth looking at that. Yes, of course. Um, and uh, let me invite everyone to be with us on Thursday where we'll be talking about um, another way in which people move forward in their lives, uh, international education, international mobility, and we'll be talking about Turkish students who go who went to four different countries 
uh, out of use of uh, Aldac's um, doctoral research, a very good study, which I've seen uh, and well worth um, taking part in that webinar also. So look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Thanks again, Juliet. Thank and you. bye for now. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.